I met Sanjit Bankaroy quite unexpectedly during my recent trip to Thailand. A series of unplanned events somehow conspired to bring us together. Bunker Roy and his work have received a long list of accolades, among which are these. In 2010, he was identified by Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. The Guardian, a leading British newspaper, named Bunker Roy one of the 50 environmentalists who could save the planet. Some time back, I'd heard about the groundbreaking work that he was doing in the villages of India, but I had no idea just how powerful a model his approach has been in bringing hope and livelihoods to millions of people across the world. So, I could not miss this opportunity of sharing with you in this interview the incredibly inspiring story of Bunker Roy, the mind-blowing difference that he's making across the world in transforming the lives of disadvantaged rural people and especially underprivileged women across India, Africa and elsewhere. Sanjit Bankaroy is an Indian social activist and educator who has founded a paradigm-shifting organization called Barefoot College. It's based in Thelonia, a village in Rajasthan, India. Having got his degree in English from St. Stephen's College in Delhi, Bankaroy decided that he needed to find out what it was like to be a real Indian, as he calls it and got himself a job as an unskilled labourer in an Indian village. For five years, he dug wells to get drinking water into villages. It was in 1972 that he set up Barefoot College. Barefoot College is so called because it gives practical skills and vocational training to people from rural communities who are among the most impoverished, exploited and marginalised. This Indian college turns rural women into technicians and engineers, among other things. As quoted on Skoll Foundation's profile of Bunker Roy, Barefoot's approach has been implemented in over 78 of the least developed countries. A total of 40,000 houses in over 1,000 villages have been solar electrified by nearly 800 illiterate rural grandmothers. Only using sign language, in six months, they are solar engineers. To date, some 3 million such people, many of whom are illiterate or semi-literate, have benefited from the practical skills and knowledge that Barefoot College provides through its learning by doing approach in skills including solar engineers, teachers, midwives, weavers, architects and doctors. The work of Barefoot College shows that illiteracy is not a barrier to economic self-sufficiency, nor does it need to be a showstopper to self-development. Let's hear this extraordinary man's point of view of what it has taken to be an agent of global transformation. Thank you so much for joining us today for this serendipity <laughs> serendipity indeed isn't it and um, so on my travels I do meet really you know interesting people here and there and uh, like the way that we just happen to bump into each other here in Thailand is just so amazing to me so I thought <laughs> I, you know we have to have a conversation and the reason we have to do that is because you are truly unique in the sense that you had a vision, you had an idea at some point, and then you turned it into a global enterprise that is changing things all over the place. So I want to talk about that. But before we do that, I, I, I read somewhere that you were once a squash player and um, you played um, internationally, right? And then you became, mm -hmm. you, you actually got a degree and then you became a laborer, I you did. told me yesterday. How did that happen? <laughs> I was the squash champion in 1967. Yeah. And in 1967, uh, on the 1st of November, actually, I said I'm going to do away with my three-piece suits and my ties and start wearing kurta pajamas. And then I headed for the village for the first time. Uh, not knowing where I was going, what I was doing, and uh, completely upset the family. And I wanted to see whether I could uh, last it out, I, whether I could really uh, make it work. 
So it's actually an exploration. Why did you do that? I didn't know my own country. Ah, and you thought that was important? It's important to know how the, uh, as they say, how the other half dies and how the other half lives. It's important to know the villages of India, which is really what India's, Bharat is all about. And that was the only way to do it. What's Just Bharat all about for you? Rural India, 19th century India, culture of India, deep-rooted India, slow, very slow part of country which takes time to change and you have to get used to that pace. And that is the unlearning process you have to go through, how you're used to 100 miles per hour lifestyle and all of a sudden you come to zero miles per hour. And nothing moves, nothing works, nothing seems to change. That's not true. So all that you have to go through yourself, there's no other way. And it also um, equips you to uh, understand the problems of India and see what you can do about it. But it was important for me to see it face to face and not through third hand. So it was good that I did it and did as you, a laborer. When you did that, did you, was it then that you had a vision of what was missing and where you, could, you wanted to make an impact? Or how did that come about? How did the initial seed come about? I didn't have any long-term vision. Okay. I just wanted to work in a very quiet place, in a, in a village where I could contribute in a little way, a very small, modest way. And it all seemed to grow slowly. I didn't know that 40 years down the line I would have an organization. I still think mentally that I'm still very small. Because I always, I never made any plans. I never had five-year plans or ten-year plans or one-year plans. I just lived by the day and you solve the problems and by the day. Mm -hmm. And that made it very satisfying because you see it happening in front of your eyes. You see the change happening. You see the, the change that uh, small little acts can make there. Drinking water, finding water in a well. Small, small things like that really uh, kept you going. And if you could make um, an impact in those, what you call small things, which are essentially fundamental to human existence, right? Human health and um, survival. If you can make uh, uh, an impact to that, then that could make so much more possible. Is that how it came about? Because you now the work with solar energy. Effect. Yeah. The snowballing effect was very important. The fact that you did one small thing which had a ripple effect and it went all over. It's with the small things that make the big difference, I think. Hmm. Small, small acts that really, uh, that you get to the really, the poorest of the poor and make that work. Hmm. Then it spreads, then people get to hear about it. The Bush Telegraph is very strong in, in, in Bharat. You know. The Bush Telegraph. Yes, it's very strong. You don't have, you don't need radio and television no. for that. Everyone gets to hear about it. Yes. And that's how uh, Thelonia grew. Thelonia grew with, uh, small input in trying to find problems, solutions to drinking water. Okay. And then we build health, then you bring work, then you, small, small. But the most important thing was to invest in people. Someone says, why didn't you start a health program? I said, I didn't have the right person. The right person has to come along and you don't have to advertise. They get to hear word of mouth. That's how it started. Mm -hmm. But there were small ingredients in, in the Barefoot College which made it a bit different. For instance, we didn't, uh, very early on, didn't want to give any so much importance to qualification. Right. To degrees and qualification. That didn't make the man because, or woman. Because a lot of your people, the people that you have barefoot uh, colleges worked with and is working with are semi-literate or even illiterate. They have definitely not had the privilege of established education, right? And I didn't think that was important. I kept telling them that was not important important thing was how much of a human being you were, how much compassion you had, how much tolerance you had, how much patience you had, how much humor you had. If you want to work in a rural area, if you didn't have a sense of humor, don't go. You have to laugh at yourself. You have to be able to laugh at you. So uh, that was important. Incidentally, if you had a degree, all right. If it didn't, it didn't matter. And that investment in people really made the big difference in the Barefoot College. Because we had people working with us for 30 years. No mm. one's ever left. <laughs> no one's ever left. So why should they leave? Can you 
say something about the, the programs that you have developed there and how and for whom? In, it's in all uh, around basic minimum needs, water, education, health, employment, environment, empowering women. It is all basic needs you'll find everywhere in every village in India, indeed the world. So if you can find a solution to that, then you come up with a solution, with a combination that is unbeatable. You say that, you say the basic solutions, but, uh, basic things, but actually, yes, they're, they're, I would say more rather fundamental rather than basic. For example, some of your projects and programs are just uh, amazing. They're very innovative and they're leading edge in terms of technology. For example, um, Solar Mamas, you know, the, the project that you have for elderly women to be able to become s economically self-sufficient. Uh, I mean, solar panels, which they install themselves, we, we know, which including the unit, which includes Wi-Fi, which then they service by, by um, uh, you know, providing the energy that they manufacture through those solar panels, etc. That's not an obvious project. And that's not a basic project. It is entirely based on common sense. You go to a village, you find half the village, the youth is not there. They've gone out looking for a job in a city. What do you, what do you fall back on? Who do you have, the very old and the very young that are left behind? And we never underestimate the fact that the very old have traditional knowledge and skills that are almost devalued, almost disappearing has to be revived, has to be respected, has to be applied, and they're doing it for hundreds of years. So why not invest in those people and see whether they can, there can be a mixture of the modern and the traditional. That's important, the mixture of the modern and the traditional. The modern, the knowledge that they have which is very traditional, how can they adapt, how can they adjust, how can they pick up something which is very sophisticated. Is it possible? So that's the challenge. And, that's, and that has proved very successful because once you invest in these people and you see that they see that you trust them and you have no doubts that they will be able to manage to do it, then you fly with it. The idea flies. But you must have encountered uh, resistance along the way. For example, I know that um, even young people, let alone people who have been brought up in a certain cultural, traditional environment, um, you know, uh, and especially in rural communities, they have like a, a way of thinking. They live into other people's expectations of them. And so, you know, uh, presumably there was some resistance both from themselves and, and the people around them. The and resistance came from people of our kind, you and me. Okay. They couldn't believe that a woman who has never been to school or college, cannot read and write, can become a solar engineer in six months. They just can't believe it. it's in beyond their comprehension. That is the biggest problem we had, to convince our own kind that it was possible, that an alternative was possible. An alternative is feasible and, in, and low cost and possible to replicate and scale up. But you can't do this alone. You have to do it with partners. And we had a great partner in the government of India. We have an extraordinary collaboration with the government of India that should we choose any solar mama from any part of the world, the government pays the airfare and six months training per course for the grandmother to come wow. to India. So you work with organizations, you work with governments to leverage... Um, scaling up. Scaling up and, uh, and obviously creating, uh, you know, availability of funds and so on. That's a whole other aspect of your enterprise, right? Sure, that the partnership is very important. You can't do these things alone. You have to have some people who believe in you, who have the same likes and dislikes, who have, this, who have the same philosophy, who actually uh, dream the way you do. And uh, like-minded people like that are all over the world. Yes. You find them. But coming back... But, ba but you know, I'm uh, talking about solutions. We believe very strongly that for an rural problem, you have to have a rural solution. You sh cannot have an urban solution to a rural problem. And people make that mistake all the time. For instance, drinking water. You ask someone in the village, um, you ask an engineer, how would you solve the problems of drinking water? They'll say, put in a hand pump. 
drill 800 feet below and you take water out. You go to the old man in the village and say, what, how would you solve the problem drink water? He says, collect rainwater. Why do you take water out of the ground which you don't take, let, allow to go in? Recharge is very important. The water resources on the ground are fast depleting. You're not recharging it. Why not collect rainwater? So after installing 1,700 hand pumps in 1990, we said, now no more water taking out of the ground. We are going to start collecting rainwater on a large scale. Now that was traditional technology which has stood the test of time. And yet we devalue it because an engineer says you should put in a hand pump. Why is that? So we are bringing in common sense back. We are demystifying technology and decentralizing it right down to the community level and making them own it, control it, manage it. Now that is very Gandhian. It's very not Gandhian. Bunker Roy, it's Gandhian. Yes. It's a Gandhian concept of yes. self-sufficiency. Depend on each other. Mm -hmm. That is something which the Barefoot College has managed to demonstrate on a large scale. And it's seriously disruptive. Very disruptive because we are, we are challenging lots of people at fundamental levels. Well, education system for big, one. Big problem. A and just the established order in, in general. Yeah. We are just saying that if you have to solve rural problems, you don't really need to go to school and college to pick up a skill. You have the skill right there, but you can in, in upgrade it. You can, in, you can uh, do something um, uh, substantial with it, but you should not ever devalue it. Hmm. This is something the Barefoot College is, uh, this is the bottom line, non-negotiable. Traditional knowledge and skills has stood the test of time. Don't devalue, don't disrespect, and do not uh, destroy. Mm -hmm. That is what we were. And I think this traditional knowledge skill, not only in India, but everywhere in the world, mm -hmm. every traditional society, every traditional village has this. Mm. It's just a question of recognizing it, just a question of bringing them out of their little hole where they think this is not possible. I Can we talk about um, how you have uh, dealt with resistance that you have faced? Because these are, I mean, today we are in, you know, we're, we're in 2017, but you started in the 70s. And along the way, a lot of what you're talking about to you seems like is common sense. But as we say, you know, it will have occurred as threatening uh, to the established order. So I, I would imagine you will have faced a certain amount of resistance along the way. How have you overcome if that? If you go to a village and you find everyone is for your project, there's something wrong. Someone has to object. <laughs> Someone has to resist. Someone has to say this is not right. And if that someone comes from the exploitative class, even better. If the money lender is against it, if the politicians against it, if the local bureaucrats against it, great, because you're in the right direction. Because these are the ones who actually want the status quo to remain, and this is what you have to break. And there's something and the invested. Only, and the only way to break it is to increase the capacity and confidence of very poor people to have a skill which no one else has. Which no one else has. And no one else believes they can have because they haven't been to school and college. This is the secret, I think. First, is, that is what. And secondly, we came to the conclusion that men are untrainable. You know, men are restless. Men are compulsively mobile. Men are ambitious. And they all want a certificate. A woman doesn't do that. A woman, once you train a woman, will always train another woman. A man, once you train a man, will never train another man because he thinks his job is going. So the mental mindset of the woman is perfect for this development that we're doing. Mm. Whenever we've trained uh, solar mamas in uh, countries in Africa and we've gone back to see them, the first thing they say is that when they go back, they train someone else. They will never let it be to themselves. They'll always train someone else. And as a result of the quality of life improving in some of these villages, you find reverse migration. You find people coming back to the village for the first time from the slums. Mm. The first time they see light coming, mm. first time they see hope, yes. first time they see small businesses they can start, first time they can see the whole lifestyle changing, first time men-women relationships have also increased, have also uh, improved. We asked these four women from Tanzania um, when they came back, I said, what has improved? Uh, 
in your village. So they said something in Swali and the whole uh, conference erupted. I said, what did they say? They said our sex life has also improved because they all they're all happier. Back. They're happier. <laughs> and the women and the men are scared of them now because they have a skill which no one yeah. else has. So this is, and they become role models, they yes. become leaders. Yes. So all these spin-offs we didn't even imagine. But when they went back, they found themselves to be uh, respected, accepted, husband being scared, husband accepting them. These are small things that happen. And now they are, they are the only solar engineers of their country. Mm. The women are the only solar engineers of the country and that makes a big difference and they don't want to fail. They want to make sure it works. Why do you think, I mean you've said some of those things now, but I specifically want to ask you that particular question which is why do you think, you've said it before and you said it again when we were speaking yesterday, why do you think women are the key to uh, serious change? They're the roots. They're the ones who keep the family together. They are the ones who do the agriculture. 90% of the agriculture operations are done by women, rural women. They are the ones who bring up the children. If you educate the woman, then the child, then you make sure that the child goes to school. Uh, it's not good investing in a man in a rural, rural family. I think it's, you know, they said, what's the most powerful way of communicating communicating today? Is it telegraph? Is it telephone? It's tell a woman. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but that comes back to well. Okay, that's a slightly okay. That's a slightly different um, aspect, if you like, of women's nature that I think you might be referring to. But anyway, um, but no, you really, you really do believe that women are yes, change agents. The change agents. They are the future. Mm -hmm. As uh, who said something? They all they hold up half the sky. Hold up half the sky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. No, they are the ones who we think. Uh, I think it's been very wise that we have invested in these women. And it's really snowballed into something which uh, people now accept. The barefoot model is Gandhian, it is bottom up, and it empowers women. And not only women in, as engineers, but also as entrepreneurs. So while they're there for six months in Polonia, we teach them on other skills uh, how to open a bank account, how to uh, start an enterprise, something about their health, something about their bodies. So we have something called the Enrich program, which always is a part of the six-month training program. So they're not only engineers, but they're also eventually entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. What have you learned about yourself in the last 42-year journey? I have learned uh, to be less arrogant, to be infinitely patient, to uh, never underestimate someone who is illiterate, never ever uh, look down on people, always open to learning, and that is what I've learned over the 42 years. And I've had no patience for people of my own kind. I actually have a healthy disrespect for people who came from my background. And I show it and I make them known. And I say, what is it, what's wrong with you when you had the best education that you can't go back and give something back to your own community? Something dreadfully wrong in our educational system that makes people do that. What's your vision for, in your own lifetime, for the work that you're doing? I want the Telonia to be taken over by the second generation in my lifetime. I want to see it work in my lifetime, and I want to see it change in my lifetime. I've had so many people saying, look, the old Telonia does not exist anymore. It has to be a new Telonia in keeping with what's happening in the world outside. And you have to have people who can do that for you. So I'm now withdrawing more and more in Telonia, just staying there, just my presence is there, but everyone else is running the organization. We have a second generation uh, woman uh, in the organization called Bata, who was two years old when her father came, and now she's taken over slowly. We have Megan, who is the Barefoot College International, who's looking after the international operations, and also doing something about revitalizing the old systems of working in the organization. So I would like to see that happening in my lifetime. And that's uh, very satisfying to see it happening. Mm -hmm. 
though I um, <coughs> give everyone a lot of trouble, I disrupt a lot of people, I make everyone very happy, unhappy. But I think uh, it's when Megan came first time, every week she would resign. Then after one year she resigned every one month. And now she runs every six months. So it's a good progress. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting that. Okay. A lot of uh, people, especially young millennials, uh, you know, but, but I, I guess throughout right now, I, I'm seeing want to make a difference. That term, want to make a difference, you know, which came, making a difference, be the change. That kind of thing which came from Gandhiji is something that has become a norm in our in our aspirational culture, and a lo lot of people want to become indeed social entrepreneurs. What qualities would you invite them to develop? In the young people today, sadly, I see a lack of courage. They are not willing to make their parents unhappy. They're not willing to take the first step, independent step, and say, I want to find myself first and go out and see what I can do. And they're always restricted by family pressure. Uh, I, we had this Jagitri Yatra where 450 men and young boys and girls came. And I asked the same question. I said, well, why is it that the higher you go, the more educated you supposedly are, you have less courage? What prevents you from getting into a train, going anywhere 50 kilometers and getting off in the first village and doing something? You don't have to bring money. You don't have to bring projects. You don't have to bring... You just go and stay there and live there and see what it's like for your own self, for your own education, because that's when you're young that you can do it. But really, lots of people don't have that courage today. And that's the sad part of the education system today. So I don't uh, take anybody, at least as far as I can make out, people who have high qualification, but they have to prove their worth as human beings for us to me. So courage, develop courage, absolutely. Respect for tradition, courage, the whole question of continuity, the whole question of how it is possible to bring about change slowly, hasten slowly, don't be in a hurry. All this is, and, and to be inclusive to bring people along with you, take it along. Mm -hmm. A social entrepreneur is someone who is mis misunderstood for at least 10 years. You know, you have, you, have to, you have to take people along with you. You mm -hmm. have a vision, you have to go there, but lots of people don't understand that. And that is your, your communication skills have to be very important. So in some parts, sometimes in Tilonia, we say your training program is for the next three months, do nothing. Just sit, don't open your mouth. Just sit and listen to people. Listen to what people have to say. Don't be arrogant. Don't always have an opinion. There's so someone who has a better opinion, respect that. That we don't have enough in the army. Excellent. Thank oh, you. That was so amazing. Thank you very much. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. <laughs>